Well, good morning, church. Good morning, West Campus. We see you out there and we love you. Also, good morning, Converge, and all those who are streaming literally around the world. It's a, our great privilege to uh, worship Jesus with you this morning. Would everybody take a Bible, no matter where you are, and turn with me to Numbers chapter 27, and also take out your sermon notes. Uh, we're in a series called Side by Side. I love the bumper that uh, you saw, uh, reminding us that we're in life side by side. And, and we, we started this study for two reasons. Number one is we really wanted to look at uh, biblical discipleship and how we influence each other biblically. I mean, the other reason, which has really been fun, is to unpack some spiritual leadership principles. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do. If you're a grandmother or you're a mechanic or you're a, you, a, a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, whatever you might be, all of us in every capacity in life and every stage of life are influencers. We are leaders. We're leading our children. We're leading our neighbors. We're leading our husbands and our wives. We're leading. We're all leaders. And that's really what this is about, what we can learn about spiritual leadership principles. Now, this morning I have the very wonderful task of unpacking for us, I think, the two most popular Old Testament leaders who walked side by side, Moses and Joshua. They walked side by side. They were remarkable in everything they did together. Uh, they were among the most instructive of all side by side relationships in all the Bible, in my opinion. And their relationship is interesting because it has a special niche. Uh, when you study Moses and Joshua, what do you think about? Well, at least what I think about is transition. It's succession. Moses led for all those years, and then he turned it over to Joshua. And that's the passage we're going to be studying this morning. We're actually going to be looking at leadership in transition and in succession. Now, in case, once again, you're thinking this would not apply to me. I'm a mother of, of a child or three children, or I'm a grandmother, or I'm a this, or I'm that. I, I'm, I'm a retired gentleman. All that's not true. Everywhere in your life, you're going through successions and transitions. And these principles will apply to you. You're selling a business and moving to another business. You're moving from this state to another. You're moving from one home to another. There are transitions and successions in everything we do in life. All of this is very Monday morning applicable. So you've turned to page 136, Numbers chapter 27, out at West Campus and also in Converge. Numbers chapter 27, page 136 in the Pew Bible, if you will. So it's early in the Bible, the book of Numbers is. And we were looking at th these two men. First, Moses. Now, you need to know Moses was the shepherd of the desert. He was a very reluctant leader. Uh, and we'll talk more about him in just a moment. Uh, but he's also, when we approach this passage, he's 120 years old. And uh, that's interesting. He really was 120 years old. And uh, it's how that was true is, is for an, another message, but just trust me. And, uh, you know, I think 120 is old. Don't you? Uh, it's old. And so I started thinking, man, I'm feeling that way every now and then. Not maybe 120, but pretty close. Uh, and, you know, I, I came across the, these jokes about how you know you're really old. Uh, you know you're old when your knees buckle, but your belt won't. <laughs> Do I relate to that? You know you're old when everything that works hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. <laughs> you know you're old when everything that, you know you're old when you sit in a rocking chair out by Cracker Barrel, you've done this, and you can't get it started. <laughs> I asked somebody to help me just the other day. You know you're old when you're looking for a wonderful, dull evening at home, and nobody comes around. And for me, this, is, this one's to, to the point. You, you know you're old when you're trying to straighten out the wrinkles in your socks, and you discover you're not wearing socks. <laughs> so Moses was old. That's my point. But he was also still very fit and very spry. And then along comes Joshua. Now Joshua was probably half his age. I'm not sure exactly how old he was. But we know that he was born in Egypt a slave. Remember Moses wasn't. Moses was born in Egypt a free man. He was a prince in the house of Pharaoh. What a contrast there. Uh, Joshua was born in Egypt a slave. We know he was 40 plus years old because he came out of slavery into the desert for 40 years. He was an apprentice of Moses's. Moses discipled Joshua. In fact, Joshua was one of the 12 sp spies who went into the, into the land of promise and came back. And only Joshua and Caleb gave Moses a good report that God, God could give us the land. 
the other 10 said, too scary. There are too many. They're too big. We can't go. When Moses went up to Sinai, you may have forgotten this. I had. Joshua went with him partway up the mountain up to get the Ten Commandments. Joshua was captain of the army. Joshua was a vastly different kind of leader. He was mentored by Moses through the negative and the positive of Moses' life. They were quite a partnership. Two completely different, unique leaders called together to lead for God's sake. So, in this text, verses 12 through 23 of Numbers 27, there are five spiritual leadership principles that have to do with trans- transitions and succession in our lives. And I want to look at those. You've got your notes out. Uh, b- let's begin with verses 12 through 14. Look at those with me, please. Verses 12 through 14. The Lord said to Moses, go up into this mountain of Abraham and see the land that God has given the people of Israel. Now that mountain is actually, uh, we know, just across. It's on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, it's also uh, Mount Nebo, but it's, it's a mountain range that you look to the west. And so God takes Moses way up on the mountain range, and he looks to the west. Jericho is parallel, it seems, across the Jordan to show him the promised land, the land that the children of Israel were going to go into, but Joshua was going to lead them, not Moses. Notice the text, verse 13. And when you've seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. Because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of Zen when the congregation quarreled, failing to uphold me as holy at the waters before their eyes. These are the waters of Mirabah, of Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zen. Now that last part, verses 13 and 14 there, uh, is kind of a, a private interaction between Moses and between God. Moses came to know Yahweh at the burning bush in the desert. And now God's going to take him. He's not going to let him go into the land of promise. He's going to bring him back into the desert. And there, the two of them are going to do business together as Moses comes to the end of his life. The wonderful thing about this is you don't see Moses having any pity party. Moses had prospered long for God. He had served God as a faithful servant. There's nothing cruel here. Uh, This whole relationship is for another sermon in the sense of what happened here. Uh, Just remember Moses' anger caused this to happen. And uh, the, the main point here is the main point I want to make is there was a time for Moses of transition. Do you see that? And that's my first point. It just it leaps off the page at us. Uh, between Moses and the Lord, this was taking place. But what it's saying to us in the 21st century, any, any reader of this, is that there's a time in every leader's life for transition. That's what he's saying. First point, God establishes times and boundaries and responsibilities for all his servants, all of us. For Moses, the first 40 years of his leadership, he was in Egypt in the house of Pharaoh. That was the first boundary God gave him. The second boundary was he called him into the desert. He became the shepherd of the desert for 40 years. And now these last 40 years, he's, he is the great prophet of Israel, leading them to the promised land. And in our lives we have the same thing happen. God places us with boundaries, at times with responsibilities. Um, Some of us go to high school and that's got boundaries. And then to college and that has boundaries or uh, to trade school or to work. Our our lives all have God-given manifested boundaries for them. And, And that's what you see here. Moses says in Psalm 90 that God has established Exactly that, that he is over all things, and, but we are captured, if you will, in time, and we have special boundaries that he sets up, special boundaries. In Ecclesiastes, I love the passage, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. Mom, there's a boundary for you. There's a time for you to be a mother. There's a time for you to be a grandmother. Bankers, there's a time for you to be in that office down there, and God's going to change that and move you to this office or to another bank. Teachers, uh, there's a time for you to teach the fourth grade, and then three years later, the seventh grade. There's a, our lives are segmented up. God has places and times for everything. So this is about legacy. Leaders plan for the future because change will come. Change will come. So here's the point. Ask yourself, where am I in my leadership journey? Whatever place you are right now in your life, marketplace 
Or maybe your leadership journey spiritually, you're ahead of a home group, or you lead a Bible study, or uh, you're the father of a couple children. Wherever you are, the question is, are you evaluating that? Have you ever stopped to say, you know, I've been doing this now 20 years, and I, and I think I've got 20 more to go. Or, you know, I sense God's really changing me at this point, moving me to a different place, a different time. In Psalm 90, Moses, there are 150 psalms. Moses wrote only Psalm 90. And in Psalm 90, verse 12, he actually says this, that teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. And what he's saying there is stop and evaluate where you are in your journey of life, your leadership journey, and recalibrate your priorities so you can maximize the responsibility God's given you. That's what's happening here with Moses and with Joshua. Uh, Drop your eyes to verse 15 and verse 18. It continues on. He records this. So Moses spoke to the Lord saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, really interesting phrase there, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be a a sheep that have no shepherd. So the Lord said, okay, I'll do it. Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hands on him. What do we see here? What principle do we see here? And it's, again, surfaces so readily, just a close look at it. God is replacing Moses with a younger, well-prepared new leader named Joshua. It's just that clear, right? And I love this phrase. Look, look back again at verse, uh, verse 16. The Lord, sa- he said, Moses says to God, you're the God of the spirits of all flesh. We only see that phrase one other time in all the scriptures. That phrase means God is ubiquitous. He is omnipresent. He knows every one of us and our character. He knows every human being and their abilities, their gift mix. It's God who appoints leaders. It's his job. It's his responsibility. This is about succession. Uh, The whole idea that he sets boundaries is about legacy. We only have so long on this earth to do so many things. But this is about the future, about succession. Leaders depend on the Lord to point out future successors. It's a spiritual thing. It is. If we follow human desires, if I were choosing individuals, say, to replace you and your home group or, or myself, uh, I would probably want a person a whole lot like me, handsome, winsome, rich, <laughs> capable, always the life of the party, joyful, well-dressing, that kind of person. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Uh, It's God's job to appoint leadership. It's God's job to appoint leadership. So look around for evidence of God's hand on others that you're mentoring or that you're discipling. You know, moms, even with your children, grandmoms with your grandchildren, watch them carefully to see what God's doing, who they are. What... Train a child up in the way they should go and they'll not depart from it. You know what that means? It means understand who they are and where they're headed and keep directing them that way so that God can use them. God can use them. Look at verse 19 and 20. Verse 19 and 20. We continue in this process of unpacking some of these principles for transition. Make him stand before Eleazar the priest, verse 19, and all the congregation, and you shall, you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him with some of your authority. Couldn't be simpler. That all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. God gave Moses and the people a process for successful succession with Joshua. He gave it to them. If you remember the life of Moses, you should remember that Moses in his early years did not know how to delegate. Remember that if you've studied the Old Testament? Uh, His father-in-law had to come to him and say, you're not going to survive because he had this massive nation 
to oversee. And he was trying to judge every one of the problems. So he appointed judges and he began to delegate and break down the whole nation and, and it succeeded. Moses, by the time he comes to 120 years old, he has learned his lesson. Giving away authority, challenging men and women to do things that they need to be doing to stretch them. And that's, that's really what this, this leadership principle is about. One theologian writes this. We need to acknowledge that if we work, we have been involved in, if the work we've been involved in ceases uh, when we're removed, we have not done our full job as leaders. I know many of you in the room and many of you watching and Converge and, and uh, at the West Campus, you're leaders. And so my question would be, is someone walking alongside you? Is there anyone that you're stretching and challenging? Um, I made a note here to myself. If the work God is calling us to is to continue, we've got to always be careful that our egos don't get involved, right? And that we don't get trapped in self-talk where we say to ourselves, they can't do this without me. That steals the opportunity or the responsibility for you to be giving away opportunities. Give them away. Give away authority. Give away opportunities. The challenge here is this. Leaders wisely share authority before hand, handing over the reins. They delegate. Where it be in the office there, the, 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 the law office or the dental office or wherever, you're delegating, you're challenging. Come try this. My father was fabulous at this. And his, uh, my father was a mechanic. And in his workplace, he took me to work every day from middle school, seventh grade, all the way through, actually into college. I worked with my dad. And I, I'll never forget him saying, hey, son, I can't get this nut off this flywheel. My dad could have gotten a nut off the flywheel just like that. What was he doing? He was asking me to come over and help him get there alongside him and pull this thing loose. And I'd do it. And the next time, he'd simply say to me, son, go take the nut off that flywheel. That was natural leadership that he had so the point is you should be able to point to one person you're grooming to help you or succeed you in the future if something's worth doing in my opinion it's worth sharing that opportunity and responsibility with someone else no matter where you are in life no matter where you are in life marketplace or otherwise home groups Home group leaders should always be looking for someone to share this responsibility with and challenge them to take it on. At your school, parenting, as I said before, especially in large families. You know what I love about large families who have quite a few children? They don't have a choice. So the older one takes care of the next one, takes care of the next one, takes care of the next one. We have a very close friends or have a large family, and it's amazing to watch the young men and women in their family. They're so independent. They're so competent. Why? For years they've been challenged with the authority to learn and to grow look at verse 21 the fourth one verse 21 and he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord and that's another sermon the Urim and the Thummim that's how God spoke through the priest in those early days before the word was written before there was any text at his word they shall come out, and at his word they shall, shall go in and come out, both he and all the people of Israel with him, the, and the whole congregation. What he's talking about here is communicating. God communicated directly with Joshua concerning his call. Every one of us needs to be hearing from God. Every one of us needs to be God's, you need to be Jesus' best friend. And you say, I, I, I can't be Jesus. Yes, you can. You know how you become Jesus' best friend? First, you believe that he loves you. Second, you remember that he's omnipresent. He's right here, right now, right here. Third, you realize he's inside you. He dwells in you. His very real presence, no matter where you go, all the time, his real love for you should compel you to say, what a friend I have in Jesus. He's my friend. And I can hear his voice when he speaks to me. This is about structure. Leaders provide support, uh, support systems so younger leaders can hear from God. It's about hearing from, from God. So actively prepare those you are influencing for the future. That's the challenge. Actively prepare them. And then finally, verse 22 and 23 on this fifth point. And Moses did exactly what God had commanded him. 
And they, they commissioned Joshua in front of all the people to take on this wonderful responsibility. And I got to tell you, when I, when I read the word in the scripture, commissioned, I think of the word launched, and I always think of a champagne bottle and a big boat. I don't know about you, but I've always wanted to be at one of those launchings and one of those big critters. You know, when the, some fancy dressed woman, uh, maybe she invested in this massive boat, breaks that. Do they still do that? Has anybody ever been to one of those? I just think it's a horrible waste of champagne that they do that, don't you think? But that's kind of what happens with the leader. Folks, we do this with our children when they turn one and six. We do it when they graduate between the second grade and the third grade. We have a commissioning. We, we party. Why don't we do it with, in leadership areas, for God's sake? And that, that's what they did with, with Joshua. It's about leverage to the future. Leaders demonstrate their support by passing the baton on publicly. Publicly. So make sure you build that you have built it in a way to accentuate and to celebrate transitions in your life, in your ministry, home groups, uh, men and women who teach our children, just say yes, do that. So, so these are five very real principles were given about succession and transition. Joshua took the nation into the future. And I've written this. This is a biblical model of how to make a transition of leadership. It works in all forms of organizations, everywhere, all the time, most especially in the church. So I have an announcement today. We've taken this role model, this biblical model, rather, rather uh, as it relates to transitions and uh, we chose this passage many, many months ago. It's a marvelous passage on leadership. And in fact, seven or eight months ago, we actually wrote this series side by side for this very moment, for this day, for now. And I was assigned Moses and Joshua. You can figure this out because there's an analogy here. I'm kind of like Moses. I just hope he doesn't bury me in the desert. And uh, we got a Joshua, and you're kind of like the children of Israel. This is just analogous. It's not true theologically or in reality, but you see this kind of developing here. Uh, This series of sermons was written for this moment. Uh, Today, I'm formally announcing that I'm stepping out of my present role as senior pastor and transitioning into a whole new chapter of life. I'm I'm pretty juiced up about it. Uh, This January 2019. Most of you know that. Most of you in Converge and many of you at the West Campus, you know that. I will be 70 at Christmas. Someone told me the other day that 70 is the new 50. Let me tell you, 70 is 70. (laughs) My knees buckle, but my belt won't. I thought the other day that my my socks were wrinkled, but I didn't have socks on. I mean, those kind of things are are true. And so I still think I have plenty of zip and pep, but I have a lot of things I want to accomplish in our fellowship. And so it's time to do that now. I love football season. You love football season, uh, I'm assuming. And one thing quarterbacks do is they telegraph where they're going to throw the ball. And I'm hoping that for the last 19 months, we, as we have been telegraphing the direction that we're going as a church, you've been paying attention. You know, a quarterback backs up and he looks this way and you know he's going to throw the ball that way. Over the last 19 months, we have been proposing to you uh, actually preparing you for this announcement that also in January 2019, Dr. Cody McQueen is going to become commissioned as our new lead pastor for Christ Chapel, uh, for our whole family. Uh, this, been, this is the full will and direction of the board of, of elders for our church. So as I said, it's kind of like I represent Moses, in a sense, you the children of Israel, and uh, sweet, wonderful Dr. Cody McQueen, who's out at the West Campus right now today. Uh, He is going to take over the role of leading the church along with the elder board and the rest of the staff. Uh, This is a biblical plan that we've had uh, in place for a long time. Now, you probably have some questions if this is all new to you. And so I'm going to try to ask those questions rhetorically and answer them as quickly as I can. The first question is, we just learned from this Numbers 27 that leaders plan for the future. I consider myself to be a leader. I didn't say a good one, but leaders plan for the future. So that's what we've been doing. The question should be, how have we planned for this transition? So I want to chat with you just for a moment. If you'll just hang with me, you'll understand where we're coming from. Uh, Eight and a half years ago, 
at a February annual elder board retreat, uh, Lynn and I tendered our written resignation from this role at Christ Chapel. We literally gave to the elder board a written resignation. This was February 2010. Uh, it's important for you to know that because hopefully it gives you some perspective on the on-ramp for Cody and the off-ramp for Ted uh, over, it's been eight and a half years. So when I did that, obviously you see I'm still here now working. I still get a paycheck, I think, for eight and a half years. So what was that about? And the answer is, Lynn and I had felt very led, even though I was only at the time 62, that this church has tremendous future. Tremendous. God has had his favor on this church for all these years. And if we didn't take transition seriously, we could very easily lose that platform. Very easily lose it. So many spiritual things. So I was firing a shot, if you will, across the bow of our leaders, which they heard loud and clear. Uh, thousands of people have come to Christ over the years we've been here. This church is 38 years old. started October 1980. Uh, baptisms, thousands, lives changed, marriages healed, God's spirit. It's been, it's been an incredible journey. And Lynn and I couldn't be more pleased to have been part of this thing all along the way. And really, the ministries and the growth of the church and the depth of the church, we're around the world this morning. We have five Christ Chapelites on, on Chapel Hill, members of our church on Chapel Hill, working, excuse me, on uh, Capitol Hill, working today. In, in, in D.C. for good conservative values for this country, including the vice president's own personal assistant, who's a member of this church, Steve Pinkos, etc., etc. We have 38 missionaries around the world that you support. The ministries to children are just vast and, and wide. I could go on and on, but I, I, I run out of time telling you that God has given us a platform. And so I personally believe, and so has Lynn, over all these years, we have to be very careful about this transition. It needs to be done right and appropriately. The ministry has always been a team effort. God has given us very pleasant boundaries, and you've been a part of that. Some of you watching, some of you here, uh, you've been a part of that. It's a team effort. This church does not belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus, and that's what we've seen over the years. And this last year, I've been leading to transition. And so the answer to your first question is, so have we planned for this transition? The answer is yes, eight and a half years. So, second question is, leaders depend on the Lord to point out future leaders. So, how have we been led by God in this process uh, toward Cody McQueen? Have we been led toward God at all? And the answer is yes. Uh, God has made it very clear to our board of elders what needs to happen for a good transition. And if I could be real transparent, um, this has been like building a ship in a bottle. There have been times when it has been so difficult because Dr. Cody McQueen did not know about any of this until two years ago. Uh, and I'll share with you how that, how that came about. Carefully executed, not impulsive for eight and a half years. So here's the calendar. Bear with me again. From 2010, when the announcement was made to the board, to 2013, we put together committees, read books, conferred with others, counseled. How do you do this? How do you transition a church that has several thousand people? It was, it's very hard to find that information because they're not, it's just not readily available. Um, so at the end of three years of research, we came to the conclusion we have only two options. One is to find somebody outside, a pastor who's successful in another ministry and is God-anointed and spirit-filled, and he'll come and, and minister to us. The other is to find somebody on the inside. We, we, after some discussion with pastors around the country and other counselors, we came to the realization, you know, finding somebody from the outside, uh, many churches have to do that. And some of you have been through churches who have done this. N number one, a very small percentage of them ever succeed, which is scary, because they don't know your DNA. They haven't been here for 37 years, 10 years, 5 years. The second thing is they almost always bring their own staff with them. I, our board was not willing to let our most excellent staff lose their jobs to bring someone else in. And thirdly, if uh, someone from the outside came in, we would have to actually, uh, Lynn and I would act, have to leave 
and your family, your home. We're not leaving. I mean, I mean, I guess we, we could be thrown out, but I, I mean, <laughs> there are elders here, and I guess you could do that. But, but you could see that it was precarious. So the board looked at that seriously and said, you know, is there anyone on the inside? And so after a while, the spotlight fell on young Cody McQueen. In 2014, 2015, we did some most unusual things. We did build a bottle, uh, a, a, a boat in a bottle, and here's how we did it. We uh, first started a teaching team. Prior to that, uh, I had done most of the preaching teaching and just had a guest come in occasionally, but we had a formal teaching team. Myself, Dr. Mark Bailey, Cody McQueen, and uh, Doug Cecil. Why did we do that? Well, I could use some help, yes, but that's not the reason we did it. We did it so we could see Cody McQueen in the pulpit without him knowing we were looking at him. <laughs> that's the truth. The second thing we did is Bill Egner sent him back to school, so he got a doctorate in preaching. The third thing we did is we actually put him on the board of elders so we could see him around the table. He was a very young elder. May have been the youngest elder we've ever had. So we could see him make decisions for the whole body of Christ called Christ Chapel. And then thirdly, you know, we had the West Campus out there. We put him out there as the pastor of the West Campus. He was the campus pastor. So we could see him function with his own staff of 10 or 12 staff members out there. In 2016, the board came together after some prayer and fasting and said, is Cody McQueen our candidate? And the unanimous answer was, he's the candidate. He's the candidate, which means we're going to ask him if he'll walk the pathway with us. It wasn't an invitation to become the lead pastor. It was just, would you walk alongside us? Could we reveal to you what we're doing? And so in February 2016, I actually saw Cody's uh, journal for that day. Uh, I called him up. The board challenged me, go to Cody and say, would you be willing to candidate for this role? And I, we both got cups of coffee, and we walked what we call the infamous river walk. We walked along the river and I revealed to him these little dots that I just gave you. We put you in school so we could see, uh, so you could get further training and preaching. We put you on the elder board. We, we put you into the teaching team. We, we, and when I finally stopped on this walk on the river here and said, so I'm here on behalf of the elder board and the Christ Chapel family. Would you be interested in candidating for this role? He was, yeah, stuns an overstatement. He was, he was stunned. He, he was stunned. He, he really didn't know it. And so, at least if he did, he never expressed that to us whatsoever. He said yes. After 10 days, he and his wife, Jen, praying about it, he came back and said, I will candidate. We candidated him for a year. And just a few months ago, in 2017, uh, last year, the board gathered together on a Sunday evening, and we prayed and prayed and actually I recall got down on our knees and asked God Lord is this it and remember we do everything unanimously and here's a picture of that evening we said yes he's the man and what you see here is the elder board saying yeah we're we think it's Cody McQueen we think it's him we went to him we expressed that to him and he said well uh this is amazing uh I'll do whatever God has called me to do and I thought of Isaiah 6 8 where Isaiah says Lord Send me, and that's kind of what Cody said. If that's what God wants me to do, he said, I'll, I'll do it. That's how we got here. I tell you that just to be sure you understand this has been careful planning. It's been very difficult. It's been very spiritually led. It has not been impulsive. It wasn't that one day I was real tired and said, hey, young man, come over here. I need some help. Uh, it didn't work that way at all. This has been a very God-honoring, Christ-fulfilling spiritual push three leaders wisely share authority before handing over the reins how have we prepared him well cody has been prepared by christ for this job he's 37 years old i was 32 when i came here he's been here 11 years he's done so many different jobs on our staff over these last 11 years god's given him a wonderful wife and jen two super young boys that alone is a training camp right there, those two young boys. They're marvelous. But you know, as a father, you've got more than just a church to take care of. You've got, you, you've, got, you've got a family. He can preach. He can teach. He has the full unanimous approval of the elder board. Four, fourth question or comment, 
Leaders provide support systems so young leaders can succeed. So what have we done to provide safety nets for uh, Dr. Cody McQueen? And the answer is Bill Egner and I still meet with him every week. Constantly we're mentoring him and tutoring him. Uh, there's a lot of things that Cody's still learning. We pray for him com- uh, all the time. He's, we're, we're walking alongside him, side by side. You know, it's easy for me to tell stories about my life because I've lived so much longer. And the longer he lives and the more experience he has, the more he's going to see God at work in him and, and the more things he's going to have to teach you and the more developed his spirit's going to become in teaching. The final thing is leaders pass uh, a baton publicly offering their support. So how are we officially going to pass the leadership role to him? Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do it based on Numbers chapter 27 where Moses brought Joshua before the people in January, we're going to bring Cody before you here at the main campus, and, and the elder board is going to commission him as lead pastor for Christ Chapel. In the meantime, um, let me repeat this. I am the, the operative word here is transition, not retire. I'm not retiring. Now, the elder board, uh, I'm going to continue to work uh, my full load, but the elder board cut my salary in 90%. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, let up, will you? Um, no, I'm, and, and that's not true, but I, I'm going to continue. I'm moving to a different office. I will no longer be on the Board of Elders in January. Uh, I will be a staff member, fully involved, fully engaged. There's a lot of stuff I want to do. Uh, I'm super engaged with the Life Stage 2 and with the college ministries at Aardvark, uh, the West Campus. There's some great things happening out there. I, I've got more to do than I can possibly get done. I'm going to continue to do that. I'm only transitioning out of this role. Um, you'll still see me here. I'm still involved. My sweet, sweet wife, Lynn, is going to continue in the women's ministry. She has been on our staff for some time, part-time, and she's going to continue teaching and helping with all those things she does, women's mentoring with the women's ministry. So we're still here. Uh, this, is, this is a threshold of retirement, of course. How long? I don't know. Years, probably. But this is a transition. Why? Because I think we need it. The church has a wonderful future. 30 more years cannot possibly take place with me at the helm. It needs to be a new lead pastor with the wonderful elder board as the safety net moving forward for Christ. So what are we going to ask you to do? Well, here it is. First, we want you to honor the Lord by keeping the spirit of unity. I want you to trust the leadership. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, with patience, bear with one another in love. Be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. This is very important. Second thing I want you to do, I want you to pray for Cody McQueen, support him. Don't worry about me. I'm 70. I'm almost gone anyway. I want you to take care of him. I want you to treat him as you treated me all these years. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6 says this. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, the day, today, and forever. This is the Lord's church. We're going to move forward supporting him. Three, do not underestimate the enemy. He is lurking. Uh, He's lurking. Just trust the leadership. Trust the Spirit of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, we're we're told this. Be sober-minded. Be watchful, Christ Chapel. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for some way to cause us division. And steal the platform God's given us for the gospel ministry. And finally, let's show the world an exceptional church. Normally in these transitions in our country, the attendance drops for a year or two at least. And it comes back up and the giving drops. I'm challenging you to continue to attend. And I'm challenging you to give even more in January. Show the world that that Christ can be honored in a wonderful transition that we're going to experience. And continue to serve the Lord. Philippians 1, 6 says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He's, got, he's doing, this is his work, this is his place. We're going to continue to do this, how? Side by side. Pray with me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Let me pray for us so we can, uh, we could, we could close our service. Father, thank you for the gift of, uh, of, uh, pastoral shepherding over this wonderful congregation. I pray for our future to be brighter and accomplish much more than it would have ever accomplished apart from all the good things you're doing in us. May we do this side by side. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.